I'm here with the one and only Jared Halverson. And, well, Jared, I should begin by asking, how on earth do you do what you do? You're recording for <laughs> hours on end in front of your computer. You, I mean, do you ever get burned out? How do you do it? Well, the real question is, how does anybody put up with me for that long, right? Uh, <laughs> it, it's, to, to me, once you get, I guess maybe it's a matter of momentum, right? I think there's a lot of spiritual momentum, and sometimes it's just a matter of getting started. And once you get going, it's hard to stop, uh, especially when you have something as wonderful as scripture to discuss. So uh, I'm grateful that we're moving in a little shorter direction. It's it's helping preserve a little bit of sanity. Uh, I, 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 you, you raise a great question of how do you keep from burnout? And there really is a need to kind of keep our, take our temperature often, see how we're doing, make sure we're not running faster than we have strength. And I think that especially applies in what they call the, the helping professions, whether you're a, a doctor or a counselor or a therapist or a teacher or a parent or a priesthood leader or, or, or servant of God, uh, that's, that's what we do. It's what we're called to do. And it's so hard to say no to anything when it's someone on the other side that needs help. Uh, and yet, I loved what Elder Holland said in his great conference talk about mental health. If we don't take time to be to be healthy, we will take time to be sick. Uh, and so kind of gauging how we're doing and and uh, I'm just I'm a little jealous of, of listeners out there because they can turn up the speed. I hope they do. Uh, <laughs> I meet a lot of people who say you speak a lot slower in person and I laugh. I go, I know what you've been doing and I respect that. I do the same. Uh, but yeah, creating it, you, you can't go double time. Yes. Well, well with the burnout thing, I, I had a revelation this morning as I was cooking scrambled eggs and, uh, <laughs> my, the process of, I don't know what I just kind of done a, a meditation. So I was feeling relaxed and philosophical. And as I was making my scrambled eggs, I was pondering the different methods for making a good scrambled egg. And, and I realized <laughs> that in the past I had overcrowded the pan and I had had a small frying pan and I'd overcrowded it and I hadn't taken it off the heat. And so when you overload the pan and you don't take it off the heat, you have to constantly mix it. So uh, it just gets overcooked and straight away. And so I thought to myself, wow, this is a great lesson for me of don't overload the pan and constantly take off the heat and, you know, get it back. And then you have perfect oh, legs. So there you are. That, that's what you, you've, you've taught me well already, Ben. That, that's a great, a great <laughs> insight. There, there's actually, a, there's an amazing talk from Elder Neelay Maxwell that he gave uh, to the faculty at BYU years and years ago called In Wisdom and Order. And every time I read that talk, I think I need to read this talk more often. Uh, and especially if we're, if we are over, overcrowding the pan, uh, it's an amazing message because he understands that as well as anyone as an apostle uh, and just making sure that we're that we're like he said doing things in wisdom and in order it's like we want we want our service to be sustainable right hmm. uh, we don't want to run out of of the, the emotional and spiritual strength to be able to serve people and so sometimes it's a matter of pacing ourselves and so on and I'm not very good at it but uh, but I'm working on it. Yeah, I, I've had to learn that a lot this year. I'm still trying to find a good balance and s struggling when you don't have that balance. And, you know, I, I spoke on an episode with Kurt Franken from Leading Saints that I thought I'd oh, done a rubbish. Yeah, I, I thought I'd done a rubbish job in my calling because I just, nothing was balanced <laughs> for me. And I was like, I'm still yeah. only trying that. But, you know, with Elder Maxwell, I was born in 1998. And a lot of people uh, now, now you're now you're rubbing it in, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people talk about Elder Maxwell and his talks specifically. You know, all apostles are, are great, and but no one seems to be brought up as much as Elder Maxwell did. Was it, I mean, well, he's he's the only apostle. He's the only apostle I know that has a, a quote book. Uh, right. He just had such a gift for eloquence and. And it was one that was hard earned on his part. I, I think I remember hearing that his conference talks were like the 10th draft of what he would have been working on and was just such a master. To me, he was the Isaiah of our day and, and Isaiah, such an incredible poet and writer uh, as well as prophet and Elder Maxwell was the same. I, I sometimes feel like I, I'm on a mission to keep Elder Maxwell alive for the rising generation uh, because the way he's captured thought uh, in words is just so profound. 
So yeah, I, I quote him often. My, my son's, my oldest son's middle name is Maxwell. And my wife only married me because Elder Maxwell was taken. So we're all fan, <laughs> Maxwell fans in our, in our home. But Jared, you are, we're doing Come Follow Me this year and come uh, in, we're doing Book of Mormon this year in Come Follow Me, uh, apologies. And what are you, I mean, you, you produce so much content on it. What are you loving specifically about the Book of Mormon this year? Do different things and themes come up depending on what's going well, on? You know, it's interesting because every time, great question, Ben, every time I teach, I don't, I, I don't want to just pull out an old lesson plan uh, out of deep freeze and then throw it in the microwave and thaw it out for, for it. Just, it's not fresh and it's not, uh, I mean, I want something that is hitting me currently and I, I want to teach it because it's, it's resonating in the current circumstance. And I'm amazed uh, four years ago, how relevant certain things felt to the situation at the time. Uh, and we were dealing with COVID and we were dealing in the United States, we were dealing with a lot of racial tension. And, and I saw things in the war chapters, for example, and in, in early Alma and Mosiah that I mean, seemed tailor-made for that situation. And yet now, four years later, I'm reading things and seeing equal relevance in different time periods. Uh, and though only four years have changed on our end and nothing's changed on the, on the Book of Mormon's end, it's amazing how it resonates. Well, to me, it's one of the great gifts of scripture is this principle of perpetual relevance. And so uh, I feel bad for anybody who says, oh, I've already read it. Uh, it's like, mm, but not from today's vantage point. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a thrill to, to just immerse myself in that book. Uh, I've been preparing for next semester uh, for my BYU classes, and I'm teaching a New Testament class. And, and so it's been kind of cross-training uh, with some Book of Mormon and some New Testament. Yesterday, I wanted to go through everything. I'm just doing the first half of the Gospels and trying to organize things thematically throughout the text and see, uh, kind of harmonize the various Gospel accounts. And I sat down and I just couldn't stop. So I read Matthew and then got up for a break. And then I read Mark and then got up for a break and read Luke and then read John. And, and I'd never read all four Gospels in a single day, but it was just exhilarating to see really how short they are and yet how power packed they are. It's like these little pamphlets, we could call them changed world history. And, uh, anyway, any book of scripture that I happen to be in becomes my favorite. Uh, it's, uh, and so it's a thrill to be able to spend time in God's word, wherever it might be. How do you go about, what is your process for preparing a lesson where be it for, um, unshaken saints or, or for church or this, this is something I've asked. We've had some amazing, um, gospel teachers on the podcast, uh, including yourself. Now I can add you to the, to the ranks. You're kind. You're kind. And, uh, th this is a question I've always asked because I, I find it almost a highlight of the episode in reflection is, is their approach. It's been so valuable for me and for many of our listeners learning how um, or, or seeing your insights into preparing for a lesson? Um, great question. And a lot of that has to do with the audience of that lesson. Yeah, sometimes it's not a lesson prep at all. It's simply my own personal scripture study. And that's nice because I can stop and smell all the, all the roses and linger on a particular passage as long as I want. And, and it's just meant to speak to me. Uh, when it comes to teaching classes, I try to, I try to have two audiences in mind at all times. And like when, when I'm in the classroom itself, I always have my students uh, right there in front of me, but I always try to picture the prophetic writer in the back of the room. And, and I'm trying to keep an eye on both parties. And if either one starts to roll their eyes, I know I'm out of balance. Mm -hmm. uh, if my students start rolling their eyes or nodding off, I think, okay, well, I may be resonating with Nephi in the back, uh, but my students aren't finding relevance here. So I need to make it more student-centered. But if I if my students are, are with me 100 percent, but I notice Nephi or, or Alma or whomever in the back rolling his eyes going, do I do I even need to be here? This doesn't sound at all like anything I wrote or intended. And then I realize, OK, in my effort to be student centered, I haven't been scripture focused or vice versa. OK, and so uh, if I can have those two audiences, I've sometimes challenged teachers to take a picture of their class and have it up on the desk or on the table while they're lesson prepping uh, so that they're looking at both constantly and allowing the spirit to say, you know, 
John could really use this principle. Uh, Tara is it may, may, may be more help, helped by this idea than that. And, and really trying to meet the needs of the students that you're going to have before you. In my own case, there seem to be two major approaches, uh, and they're mutually exclusive. You can't do both at the same time. Uh, one I call the flyover, and the other I call the nature hike. And the flyover is what I did yesterday with the Gospels, where you're just 30,000 feet. You are flying across the text as quickly as you can. And the nice thing about that is you can cover huge swaths of material, and you get a big picture. Uh, from 30,000 feet, you can see the lay of the land and where the river comes and how deep the mountains go. You have no idea what kind of tree is down there uh, or how many petals are on the flower, uh, but, but you get big picture that you otherwise wouldn't. And so sometimes in my study, I do this one less often, but sometimes I'll just pick a book of scripture and just read as quickly as I can. Um, I read the Doctrine and Covenants in one day once, and it was amazing to watch the restoration unfold like it was time-lapse photography and uh, or to read a book a day in the Old Testament. And all of a sudden you're dizzy with the pride cycle in the book of Judges, or you're seeing uh, thematic like statements that keep getting repeated in Exodus and Ezekiel, but nowhere else. And kind of wondering why is that? Uh, or phrases in Leviticus that seem unique to Leviticus. Um, so those, those are uh, great opportunities. Uh, I've noticed that depending on what your lesson's on, how much you have to cover, there's going to be some need for that kind of uh, broader, far, far, more far-reaching approach. But then, honestly, my favorite is just to stop and smell the roses. I, I prefer the nature hike any day. And so that's kind of my bread and butter of just slowly pouring through the scriptures and pondering what Joseph Smith called their meaning and intention. And those, those two I'm always wrestling with also where their meaning is to be true to the prophet in the back and their intention is to be true to me and the student in front of me. What am I, what does the prophet intend me to do about what he's trying to get across? And, and again, if I have an eye to application, but, and, and I'm searching for principles, I'm amazed in my own scripture study, how often some thought will come into my mind um, I need to start scrambling eggs more often to follow your good example, Ben. Uh, but, but to be engaged in the text in such a way that the Spirit can open the eyes of our understanding, as Joseph Smith ta uh, described it, and that we start to see not just what the prophet wrote and what he meant by it, but we start to see our reflection off the page. And that's how this applies to my life. To me, so much of scripture study is the the process of stockpiling principles. And you have these concentrated truths packaged for application. That's Richard G. Scott's uh, definition of a principle. And if you can kind of coax those out of the text by separating them from the surrounding historical material, then amazing things come out like, ah, that's how this verse speaks to my situation. Right. I mean, I I'm still, I'm still slightly, um, intrigued by the fact that you read Doctrine and Covenants in a day. Um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a long day, but it was a great one. <laughs> yeah, I imagine that would be a long day. But the rest of it, um, incredible insight as well. I, I love the what you said about particularly, you know, the, the less advanced principle of imagining the prophet in the room with you and the audience. I think that is so insightful, something I've never thought about before. Um, but that would. Well, I think too. I think too often, and I know uh, we professors can be guilty of this, that we think that the scriptures were written uh, to give us a catalog of the revelations they received in that ancient day, and that's one way to approach scriptures. It's wonderful. Uh, it helps you make sense of the past, but those lives are past, and ours are present. And again, this pr principle of perpetual relevance: if the scriptures are meant to help me navigate my life. Uh, then I'm not using modern skills to recreate the past. I'm using ancient wisdom to help me navigate the present. And that way, it's not just a catalog of someone else's revelations. It's a catalyst of revelations of my own. And that, to me, is where it gets exciting, where I get to enter into this cloud of witnesses, to borrow Hebrews 12, and, and engage in conversation with the, with the greatest minds and the greatest spirits uh, in, in our history and ask them questions and, and let them get in dialogue with each other. And uh, I mean, 
those kinds of conversations that we can have in scripture instead of just a monologue from a, a voice from the dust. Uh, it, I mean, I'll take dialogue over monologue any day. And when I get to speak up and share my thoughts and, uh, and again, have Lehi say something and have Job say something back and then have Esther pipe in and, and Joseph Smith uh, chime in as well. It, to me, it's when the scriptures become one great whole uh, and you're comfortable enough with them in their totality that you really can place prophets in conversation with one another. It's exciting. Are there any times when that kind of bringing it to today doesn't quite work or, or, or should we be safe to assume that it can always be applied? Uh, I, it's a strange question, but I've just in, in my life. No, no, not at all. It's a great one. I remember recently there, I was reading called... Third Nephi and something came up uh -huh. that Jesus had said to the disciples. I can't remember, but I remember kind of making a note of it and thinking, oh, maybe. And then I thought it's it's hard for me to believe that that would be for me, though, even though the spirit has kind of told me because it seems like a very specific instance for them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I don't know. I, I don't know why I doubted myself at that moment. Why is to doubt yourself in a mo in, in, for to a degree, in terms of, I think we can always say this is going to apply to me in some way, especially in the Book of Mormon, where Mormon sees our day, knows his history, and then chooses the one hundredth part that's going to be most applicable for our day. President Benson, Ezra Taft Benson, used to say that's a good way to study the Book of Mormon: asking yourself why would Mormon include this. Uh, and so kind of this search for relevance. I think the, the hesitation you had uh, may have simply been the Spirit's way of saying, yes, this applies, but not right now in the way that you're thinking of it. You know, it, it's again, I, I'm not I don't want to pull the scriptures away from their original writer or audience. Again, I don't want the prophet rolling his eyes in the back of the room. Uh, and, and so if he's kind of pushing back, going, no, 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 that's not what I meant. Uh, and we you know, to rest the scriptures to our own destruction. There's a scriptural phrase we have to be aware of and cautious about. Um, and we don't want to I mean, remove the scriptures from their original context so far that it feels like we're doing an injustice to the scriptures. That, that can be a danger. There's a term called exegesis where we're uh, drawing out meaning. And then there's eisegesis where we seem to be inserting meaning into the text that, that didn't belong there. Uh, and if we're too quick to apply without understanding original intent, then we might get ourselves into trouble. Um, but other than that, again, I think it, it's wise to always have an eye to both contexts, but to connect the two by by mining out those principles. Right. Yeah, I like that. That's good. Um, now, is there a difference between personal study, just, you know, your daily personal study and the approach you would use? Uh, and this is, you know, I'm asking this because of your expertise with helping people answer um, difficult questions of faith to studying for answers. You have those two kind of methods of study. Would you, yeah. how would you contrast those and advise people to, to differ their approach um, in that mindset? To me, th there is... Uh... I always talk about proving contraries and yes. finding these paradoxes that require us to be to hold both sides of an issue and in, intention. Uh, and I think there's a contrary there of am I studying for myself or am I studying for other people? And uh, the questions you might be asking and the situation you might find yourself in may be different from what other people are going through. And so you might find one thing for yourself and find something different for somebody else. And uh, and there have been times where I've been studying and realized, oh, this is just for me and I'm not going to teach that. Uh, or times where it seems like it doesn't have anything to do with my life. But then you, uh, I'll give you an example. I remember years ago, I was, it was, I was teaching seminary. It was parent teacher conferences because uh, we were attached to the school and the school had it that night. And this mother came in to see me. Uh, whose son was in my class, great young man. And she said, you know, I'm wondering, I, I hate to, to tell, tell you what to teach, but here's some things my son is going through and he really loves seminary and connects with you as a teacher. And I don't know is if there's any way you could like, I don't slip in something that might help him in this particular uh, aspect. 
And it was so interesting. I just smiled at her, I smiled at her, this mother and said, would tomorrow be soon enough? And she was like, what? Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to hijack your lesson plan. And I said, no, you've actually improved it. I've already prepared tomorrow's lesson with things that I thought were helpful. This was, I think we were in first Kings or something in the old Testament, uh, and some principles that I think would be good, but based on what you just said about what your son's going through, which I have a feeling he's not alone in, I'm seeing that same scripture block from a different perspective and in a different light. And it's actually better than what I planned for tomorrow. Maybe I was too focused on myself, like, oh, I really like this verse, or here's a principle that I've, that's been a blessing to me. But then shifting things and thinking about somebody else, man, new insight came and it was just, it was really powerful. Uh, that being said, so that's one half, one mm -hmm. side is let's think about other people and, and what am I doing? How's my scripture study going to affect my class if I'm a teacher or my, my children if I'm a parent, um, my neighbor as I'm a member missionary, all those kinds of things. Uh, we need to be thinking of that. I, actually, one other story along those lines. I had a, mission, a return missionary in one of my institute classes who was struggling a little bit and he said, I just don't feel the spirit the way I did on my mission. And I said, well, welcome to the club. Uh, that's totally normal. Uh, are you still doing the things you did as a missionary to invite the spirit? And I expected him to say no, because that's what everybody says. I mean, everybody has a hard time keeping up with the same level of intensity and consistency they had in the mission field. And when he said yes, I was shocked. I was like, wait, really? You're still spending that much time and you're doing it every day? And he's like, yeah, I just, it was a commitment <laughs> I made and I just wanted to keep that missionary momentum. And I'm like, you're amazing. You're amazing. You know, it's like, can, will you sign my scriptures? I mean, this is incredible. I, I, and, but then we, we wrestled with this reality of, wait a minute, you're still doing the same things. Why aren't you feeling the same spirit? And the more we, we wrestle with that, it dawned on us, your what hasn't changed, but your who and your why have. That in the mission field, what were you doing? Well, same thing I'm doing now. Who is it for? Well, for my investigators, the friends that I was making out there. And why did you do it? Because I wanted to serve them. I wanted to bless them. It's like, ah, okay. Now that you're home, who are you studying for? And he's like, yeah, it feels a little self-centered. Um, I'm not teaching this. I'm not sharing it with anybody. Um, and and why are you doing it? And it's like, well, I guess because I, I wanted to stick with a habit or I want to be that spiritual giant. Uh, and it's like, ah, okay. So again, a little more self-centered. And, and so there is this need to pivot and turn outward and study with the thought of who can I bless with this? Who can I teach? Uh, in fact, this last semester, I tried something new with my BYU students. I was a little hesitant because it's go, it goes against the normal uh, professorial plan or procedure. But I thought, you know, instead of a multiple choice midterm exam, for example, where they have to memorize all these specifics and then they uh, regurgitate it onto a Scantron, um, I decided, you know what, I'm going to create like a bunch of different topics with all kinds of different sub principles within that topic. And then I'm going to challenge my students of these six different themes, pick three of them, pray about who you know that needs to learn those things. And for your midterm, teach it to them. You're going to have to grade yourself, and that can be tricky, a little metacognitive wow. there. Um, but I want you to teach it to somebody. And you will I promise you'll study it in a different way. You'll have a different motivation. This midterm will feel different. And it was interesting. It totally did for them. A lot of them said, this was harder than most of my midterms because I wanted it to go so well. But it was way more meaningful. And I blessed somebody as I shared the things that we've been learning about in class. Uh, and that was a thrill to me. So uh, that, that's my kind of midterm and final. Now, now that's one half. The other half is if it's only about other people, then you may be missing things that the Lord wants to say to you more directly. And back to that word regurgitate, uh, it hit me once. Uh, when you think of a mother bird and what it does to feed its young, has it, forgive the, the disgusting visual image, <laughs> but you have this bird that's eating the worm, right? But not swallowing it, just, or swallowing it enough that they can regurgitate it and help in the digestive process for their young. And I've learned one of the occupational hazards of being a teacher 
is we are constantly looking for ways to regurgitate truths that we've learned. And, and for example, I'll go to general conference and I'm constantly listening with the thought, where could I use that quote? Or how would I teach that principle? And, and even in the moment of consumption, I'm already repackaging for distribution. And, and I, I realized that if the mother bird only chews in order to spit out and they never digest anything, they're going to starve to death. And as a result, their, their chicks will too. And so for any of you who are spending so much time studying for others, which is a beautiful thing, just be sure to swallow on occasion. Uh, be sure. And there's times where I'll just go to a fireside and think, I'm not, I'm not going to wear my teacher hat today. I am going to be a student only. Uh, and the same can go as far as your scripture study is concerned. Sometimes uh, over the years, I've realized if I'm studying this for my institute lesson or my BYU lesson, when I'm studying this because I have to give a fireside on Sunday, am I studying anything that's just for me? Uh, and sometimes to pick a, uh, a book of scripture or a place um, that's totally independent of what I'm doing, uh, teaching wise, that can be a help as well. That is so interesting. I, there's so much there to unpack. Um, I, where do I even pick up from first? Well, first, your midterm um, exam makes me realize why I need to move to Utah because <laughs> just things like imagine if something like that happened in in Leicestershire or, or something where where I went to university. Just uh, hey, we'll we'll save, we'll save you a place in class, my friend. <laughs> yeah. I, I went to when I visited Utah in February. Um, um, Brother w Wilcox invited me to his class, uh, and I was just amazed. I was honestly amazed yeah. as I walked into BYU and I thought, "Oh my goodness, this is actually a, a real place." Uh, these real classes going on. Um, my mother yeah. was my seminary teacher every morning. Oh, at, wonderful. Uh, you know, 5.30 a.m. Um, we'd go to the chapel for six and every day before college, my mother every day would be sat on the couch preparing tomorrow's lesson. And uh, she was a brilliant teacher, but it's just such a different world um, to hearing that. Uh, but also... Well, and and I'd, I'd, I'd sign up for a class from Brad Wilcox any day as well. But I will say this, um, I remember when I first started teaching seminary, uh, beginning of my career, and my father-in-law at the time was an early morning seminary teacher in Northern California. And he, he was out visiting and he asked, hey, can I come to your class today and just observe you teach? Might get some good uh, ideas. And I said, oh, I'd love to have you, Dad. Um, I think maybe he was just trying to make sure that his daughter was being provi provided for, uh, and I actually had a job and I was working. But uh, he came to class and we had a great time. It's a, it was a huge seminary building uh, with 10 full-time teachers and, and displays on the wall and, and everything that, that you get in a release time setting like in Utah. And afterwards, we were driving home. And I said, so what do you think, Dad? And he, he said, your lesson was great, but man, I hope none of your students ever move into my ward back in California. <laughs> and I thought, what do you mean? And he said, there's no, I can't even get close to that. I mean, everything, again, the wall displays and the pictures and, and all of this, and they would come away from my class so disappointed. And it was interesting to kind of feel his pain there and for eight years, I, I ran the Institute program in Tennessee and trained all the early morning seminary teachers. And I sensed that many of them felt that as well. Uh, but I said to him, dad, I see where you're coming from, but I've got to push back because number one, I am a product of early morning seminary. I grew up in Southern California and it was my best friend's mom one year. And it was somebody from the, from the neighboring ward in the next year. And, and they were just trying to keep their snorkel tip above water like your mom did, of preparing every day. And it's a relentless calling, uh, although it's an incredible one. And I said to my dad, don't ever underestimate the power of a consecrated disciple doing the best they can. And a group of students that may be bleary-eyed in the morning, but have made a sacrifice to come. In some ways, the great secret of early morning seminary is the sacrifice that is required just to show up 
And that's true of both student as well as teacher. And and I, I from my own experience, I know that the Lord more than compensates for that. Uh, that my students in Utah may have had a, a particular product, but the effort that it took on their part to come and receive it was so minimal. You know, what, you're walking across the parking lot after lunch? So, so again, to any of the, your listeners who are, are serving in those kinds of callings, to borrow a Book of Mormon phrase, you are not one whit behind anyone who's doing this professionally. Uh, and the, the Lord will more than make up for whatever deficiencies you may feel that you have. Uh, your act of sacrifice is one that the Lord will, will, will magnify. Mm, that's beautiful. I, I've, I feel it's such an honor and privilege to have gone through the seminary program. I really do. Me too. Um, Me too. And on your point on personal study beforehand too, I just, um, my takeaway from what you said, I think for me is I've struggled when I've even, I've even had blessings that have said, you need to, you know, put some time into study to get your answer. And, you know, I've done my classic thing of I'll open the scriptures to where I already am. I'll pray about the questions that I have for my own self and I'll go through with my notebook and hope that, you know, something comes along relating to that. But actually, um, what I, what I've learned from you and what I've taken away is that really I, I should be engaging in service. Who am I ministering to? Who am I giving a part of myself to and helping and serving and thinking of and praying for? And in that service, as I study with them in mind, as I do things and act in faith with them in mind, which, which is what I've covenanted to do anyway, right? Then, yeah, then I, exactly, can, exactly. I can have confidence that as I study, there'll be something in there for me as well. I think that's really you know, it, it's, uh, amen to that, Ben. Amen. Um, my uncle spent his career in church education as well. Um, Mike Wilcox is his name. And, uh, and Uncle Mike, I remember once t saying to me early on in my career that the scriptures are like the loaves and fishes, and there's a finite amount, and it doesn't seem like they could possibly meet the needs of everyone in their various circumstances. He said, but notice what happened. There was someone who had a little, not enough, but was willing to offer all they had. And then you have a savior that through his power and recognizing the needs of the people was able to take that finite amount of food and multiply it to the point that it filled everyone present to overflowing uh, with leftovers uh, still to come. And, and his point was, in a scripture block that you're teaching, it may, it's going to be finite uh, amount of text. F five loaves and two fishes. You got five uh, chapters and two verses, you know, whatever it is. And, and yet, with the needs of the people and the blessings of heaven, it will multiply to the point of meeting the needs of those who are there. And lest you think that you've, <clears throat> that you've tapped out of every, that you've maxed out your understanding of that text, don't forget there's still 12 basketfuls to come back to the next time you're in that part of the scriptures. Mm, yeah, that's amazing. Um, what are the most common difficult questions? People come to you with difficult questions and, and you've, um, you've answered many of them and you've appeared on podcasts, you've given firesides, um, talks, etc. What What do you think are the most common difficult questions you receive? And do you, have you developed a a way to answer them, like, it, do you answer them directly or do you have kind of a formula for helping someone navigate a faith crisis? Yeah, great question. Um, the I remember once somebody asked me, what's the, the hardest question? And I, my response <clears throat> surprised me. I hadn't thought about it. I was picturing different specific things that we wrestle with. And I said, the hardest question is the one nobody will ask. Uh, the one that is really weighing on them but they're unwilling to to voice for whatever reason. Uh, they think it'll make them look bad, or they'll they think it'll make them look like a doubter, or uh, whatever it might be. And th those are impossible to, or nearly impossible to answer because you don't know what you're aiming for. Um, I would say the most important question is whichever one they do have, uh, and if you can help reassure them that it's okay to ask and and it's worth a wrestle and. It's not a sign of weakness on their part. Uh, so part of it is to just normalize the whole process and and validate that questions are likely and not only likely, but 
the questions are a great are a great blessing you know it shows interest uh desire to understand um th there's beautiful things there the, some of the more common ones well, it's interesting because there's if you look at the gospel topics essays that the church created that is a pretty good index of the common questions that people have regarding controversial issues right and uh, most of those have to do with church history and so it's Am I struggling because there's multiple accounts of the first vision, or I'm confused about the coming forth of the Book of uh, Mormon, or I'm wrestling with the historicity of the Book of Abraham, or the Mountain Meadows Massacre is such a, a nightmare moment in our history, or I don't understand plural marriage, or race and the priesthood is troubling to me. Uh, those are all excellent questions that come up very often. And that's, again, one of the reasons that all these gospel topics essays have been written as a, as a beginning to someone's search if they're trying to make sense of some of these more difficult topics. That being said, I have learned through lots and lots of experience that it's easy to bring up a question that is purely historical or theological uh, and hold it at arm's length uh, because that way I can say, hey, this has nothing to do with me. I'm not implicated in this, but this is the issue and the church has some explaining to do. Whereas in reality, behind every question is a questioner. And typically, most people don't lose sleep over matters that are purely historical. If that were the case, I'd be geeking out. I'm like, whoa, you're a history nerd just like I am? <laughs> uh, I mean, this is the kind of stuff I read all the time. And, and, and I'm trying to make sense of the past. I, I, I'm a historian. That's what I do. And, but again, it, we're weird. We're rare. We, you don't need that many historians. Uh, and for most people, their view of history is how do I take the past and put it in service to the present? Uh, it, there's a kind of utilitarian, a pragmatism there of how, what does this mean for me? And what's interesting is behind almost all of those historical questions is a personal struggle uh, with all, all, any number of things that has something to do with that issue, uh, which is why I'm asking it. But to me, if you can help, again, reassure them that it's all good, your questions are welcome, and I just would love to understand the person behind the, the, the question and the situation that, you know, it's not a matter of like, well, why would you even wonder about this stuff? I'm not, I'm not trying to be dismissive, but rather honor, like, that's a great question. A lot of people are somewhat familiar with that issue, but don't come to it with that deep desire to understand that you have. So, man, my hat's off to you. Can you help me understand what what brings you so much passion to this topic? Uh, what is it about your experience and your perception that has made this such a troubling issue? And if they're willing to, again, if you can be non-judgmental and empathetic and, and validate the circumstances they find themselves in, if they feel comfortable opening up in a personal way, then you can really get to the heart of the matter. Now, that's not to try to avoid the issue. Uh, this is not a, a get out of difficult questions card. Um, but at the same time, they don't want me to avoid their historical question. I don't want them to avoid the personal reasons that they have it. And so it's like, can we kind of come together and keep going back and forth and see, let, let's wrestle with plural marriage, but let's try to understand where you're coming from uh, and why this is an issue. And honestly, the, there are, I mean, plural marriage is an interesting one because yes, it's historical, but so many people are in marriages or d divorced or uh, never been married. And so it's more of a personal question about, about that. Um, raising the priesthood, same kind of thing. Uh, it's more than just a historical thing. Sometimes it's a bigger question, like, can apostles and prophets get something wrong? Uh, is this, you know, why did it take so long? You know, th those kinds of bigger questions that could then, in reality, be more th things about uh, LGBT issues. Uh, is the, Are we waiting for a revelation there? And And what I'm you know, or is my church, does my, how do I, how, does, how do I come to grips with racism in, in the history of my church? Uh, and, and wrestling with those difficult issues can, can be a challenge for anybody. 
So um, I, I'm happy to go down any rabbit hole that somebody brings in when, when we sit down together. Uh, but again, I want it to be both historical and personal because it's a, it, they're, they're coming at it holistically. I want to be able to respond to them holistically. I'm amazed that I think it, I mean, I have a PhD in American religious history. I study anti-Mormonism. This is what I do. And I think that's what gets people in the door, so to speak. Um, of just, hey, this guy seems to, A, I'm not going to trouble him with my concern because he's probably already aware of it. And that's always been true. Um, but, and so I can be, and he's not like my, my, my spouse. He's not my, like, I don't know this guy personally. So I'm less uh, emotionally vulnerable to, to him. So, uh, and, I, and I think that leads people to engage in the conversation. But I'm amazed once we get going, the the historian hat comes off, and the therapist hat comes on, uh, and and it's more. Let me understand your situation and where you're coming from and how you feel about that. And because here's this issue, but you've got all kinds of personal experience and perception that's determining how you're approaching this issue. So let's handle the whole thing. And if I can point to a book that you might want to read or. Uh, an, a, an article that helps explain that tricky part of church history. Great. Um, if I can just answer a question for you and that's all you really needed, happy to do it. Uh, but so often there are deeper things and it's more than just, when, when I meet with people, there's a certain diagnostic phase that has to precede the prescription phase. Any good doctor will do that, right? We don't just sit down and look at the patient and go, oh, well, you obviously need, need this. It's like, whoa, you haven't even done an examination yet. So uh, to try to understand where the person's coming from and in that diagnostic, is this a head issue or is it a heart issue? Uh, do they, is their faith intact, but they just can't make sense of this tricky part of church history? Then it's like, oh, okay, let's just answer the question and help you resolve that. Uh, you, your your testimony is secure. There's just some stuff that you didn't understand. Well, let's let's address that. But if it's been up there long enough that it starts to creep down into the heart, and now it's not just a question; it's more this general doubt or this concern, sometimes even second guessing the Holy Ghost, wondering if do I even have a testimony? Is there any basis for it? Is this just emotional uh, and not spiritual. I mean, those things, then it's like, oh, okay, in this diagnostic phase, we're going to have to go deeper and wrestle with what faith is all about and how do we come to know the things of God and what is a, a search for truth going to look like? I mean, how deep do the cracks go in the foundation? And so how much of this do we need to tear out and start over? Uh, you're, you said your question is about LGBT issues. Uh, we can get there. How do you feel about God? Do you still believe in him? Mm. Uh, and and if that's the issue, like, okay, I promise we'll eventually get to the point where we can talk about LGBT issues. But, man, we've got to know God uh, along the way or none of this stuff really makes sense or even matters. So, um, and again, so, so much of it is just having, taking, and any minister can do that. The minister... I, again, I think the challenge is, well, I don't have a PhD in religious history and I, I can't answer all those questions. It's like, well, do you have a listening ear and a non-judgmental heart? Then you can start. And it's almost like going to your primary care physician. And if they realize, well, this I'm diagnosing, this is a case that's far beyond my area of expertise. You're going to need to go see a, a surgeon. Let me recommend you to a, a specialist and he or she can do that. And as a specialist, quote unquote, I wish that there were more people who realized that they are already qualified to be a primary care physician. Uh, if you're a friend, a family member, a ministering sister or brother, again, all it takes is a listening ear and a non-judgmental attitude. And just amazed, I'm amazed at how often someone just needs to know they're not alone that they're being heard in all of this. Often it's a sense of being, feeling like they're far from heaven and and where is God in all of this? I mean, honestly, that is one of the biggest and most frequent questions that we eventually get to is, I just, 
I don't feel close to God and I, I don't, I'm not having experiences with him. And, and if we're so focused on, but you have to be able to say that, you know, the church is true to me, that's secondary to, I have a relationship with my father in heaven. And if that's intact, then so many of those other things fall into place, or you'll at least have a reassurance of your faith that it is founded and just to be patient and answers will come in the Lord's time and in the Lord's way. That's very helpful because I, I, I've i noticed in myself, sometimes there's, I'm trying to change it, but there's an inclination when someone will, you know, say family members who have left the church or something will out of the blue say something like, oh yeah, well you, you follow Joseph Smith and he's a liar and a charlatan. I'm, I, the, you want to get instantly defensive and be like, how dare you, you know, start singing <laughs> praise to the man and, uh, in their face. Or something. <laughs> and it's like, no, it's actually, you know, I can completely understand why with uh, new information that we kind of get that people who um, may be struggling with their relationship with God may sort of come to those issues and it's kind of a, you know, the thing they arrive at and, and, and chew over and, and stay yeah. on. And, and that doesn't make sense, but um, yeah. so turning, turning to a different subject slightly, but still linked to that. I wanted to ask you because of your expertise in early American religious, his, religious history is, do you feel like there is a, a rise in anti-religious rhetoric in our time in contrast to previous generations we kind of hear that but do you think it's actually the case because i mean we're not being persecuted as much as our, our forebears did um in american frontier times but yet there still feels totally, like totally. there's an agenda but but the irony that was when the early saints when the early latter-day saints were being persecuted it was by fellow christians primarily hmm. which is tragic um whereas in our day uh it's more of a, a higher order worldview conflict um, where it's, I'll put it this way. I do a lot of interfaith work. And when I do, I'll often use Google Earth as my analogy, because with Google Earth, you can zoom in or zoom out. And as you do so, certain boundaries will appear and disappear. Uh, and when you, when you're really up close and, you know, zoomed in, you can see city lines or county uh, boundaries zoom out and all the county lines disappear because now we're looking at different states or different provinces uh, zoom out further and those all disappear and it's just the out the you know country borders zoom out again and even those disappear and you just see the outline of con continents and with any religious community if you zoom in far enough all kinds of boundary lines will appear uh, within historical mormonism so-called there's the LDS, there's the FLDS, there's the former RLDS, there's there's all these different, but zoom out from that and people are like, I don't know, you guys all believe in the Book of Mormon, don't you? Uh, it's all the same to me. And they kind of homogenize us. Uh, you can do the same thing with Methodists, you can do the same thing with, with Baptists, there's these subdivisions within them. But you take a bunch of Protestants, for example, that disagree on certain, you know, ecclesiology or different approach, um, and they're against each other. But as soon as a Catholic walks into the room, they all kind of come together in lockstep and go, Protestants unite, uh, because there's a different other. Well, as soon as a Jew or Muslim walks in, then the, the, the Protestants and the Catholics team up and they're like, okay, Christians unite. Um, and in a similar way, as soon as someone, an, an atheist, for example, a skeptic, as soon as they walk in, then, okay, all these people of faith will join. Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, Hindu, uh, Jewish. I mean, people who believe that there is something above and beyond us, that there is some reality to the transcendent. And in the past, God was such a taken for granted. Um, God was such a part of the lived experience of people that they had differences of opinion in interpreting what their experiences with God meant. But there was a common denominator that, that we believe in something above us. And, 
in early America, for example, that there was a kind of a a typecast uh, or, or a trope character uh, uh, in in most uh, towns, and they called it the village atheist. Uh, and the village atheist, the fact that that's a singular noun instead of a plural one, it's like that that it was lonely to uh, disbelief was a lonely thing uh, back in the 18th century, 19th century, early 19th century, and so on. Um, and yet that uh, what's grown, in my opinion, is how comfortable people can be in rejecting the idea of God in general. And so uh, or the need to have any church organization or religious structure to 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 connect with God. And so there are ups and downs in the history of religion. Uh, there seem to be cyclical of periods of decline and then periods of revival. In America, we talk about the first great awakening in the 18th century and the second great awakening in the 19th century. And some have numbered a third and even a fourth great awakening. And many are are waiting and crossing their fingers that there will yet be another great awakening uh, to follow this period of decline that we're in currently. Um, Great Britain uh, is an interesting case study. Uh, Europe in general uh, is is has struggled in terms of holding on to religious faith. Uh, I read a book on on the history of secularization in Great Britain that was fascinating, and one of one of its points was uh, the straw that broke the camel's back was when women left the church, and when when mothers and sisters and uh, began to question and not pass down belief to their children, it kind of opened the floodgates uh, with children wondering, well, if you know, I don't even have a religious belief to reject. I wasn't raised with one, that kind of a thing. Um, so I think the the lar the growth of the nuns, so called N O N E S, those with, that say they have none, no religious affiliation. Uh, many of them still have some nominal belief in God, uh, but don't feel like they need to have any kind of religious organization to to tap into. There's a, a loss of faith in, 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 the in, in institutions in our day, and much mm. of that is justified. The rising generation has been burned by big companies and by governments and, and organizations. And so no wonder they would prefer to just be individuals. Uh, the pendulum has swung away from community feeling toward individualism. And, uh, and I can understand some of the reasons why. But th that definitely has led to uh, a, an evaporation of much of the faith that was that was present. Uh, it's no longer the village atheist. It's all kinds of village atheists. And it's no longer lonely. Uh, one of the great things that churches do is create community. Mm -hmm. And to leave a church and to sever yourself from the social side of things can be a lonely thing. And it hasn't really been until the internet age. The internet has been able to has created virtual communities of of atheists and skeptics, uh, of purely secular people, where they don't have to feel alone anymore. I mean, ex ex Latter Day Saints, for example, there's an online community uh, where they can they don't have to feel alone. Um, I mean, early secularism uh, in both especially in Britain, but also in the United States, they would try to create secular churches just to create some kind of community. And they had a, a secular hymn book and, and secular sacraments in some ways. And I mean, the French had this temple to the goddess of reason. And, you know, so there's sometimes trying to take what religion does well and, and de-Christianize it so that we can have the same kinds of trappings and same kind of uh, forms and functions, uh, but moving people in a different direction. So it's definitely something that we are up against. We're not the first generation to deal with it, but I don't know if it's ever been on this scale, again, because of the internet. Uh, but I'm also, I, speaking of Elder Maxwell, where we began, <clears throat> um, he once said, how ironic that the so-called post-Christian era will end with the coming of Christ. And wow. I love that irony, you know, and and Jesus said it would be this way. Read, read Matthew 24, read Joseph Smith, Matthew. 
this, one of the signs of the times is exactly what we're living in, that there would be an evaporation of faith and there would be false prophets and false teachers and false Christs and, and the elect would be led away. Uh, and, and no wonder the Lord asks in Luke chapter 18, when the son of man returns, will he find faith on the earth? And that to me is a beautifully vulnerable question on the Savior's part. Uh, when I return, is it, will it be a post-Christian era that I'm reversing? Will people still believe in me? Will they still be reaching up for me? Will they be watching steadfastly for my return and trying to prepare an earth with the sufficient faith to help usher in that, that millennial glory? It's quite sobering to think about, really. And Well, I, I have to bring this up before we close because it's something I'm yeah. very passionate about and yeah. it's your, is your talk, Harmony in Pursuit of Orthodoxy. Um, it's something when I first listened to it, it blew me away and I've listened to it about four times. Um, just to, especially, I'd love to get your thoughts on it following on from what you said in that we, we are, or it feels like we're living in extremely divided spaces. I know in, in Britain, there's a lot going on at the moment with immigration that is causing incredible heat. And in America, where again, a, a huge portion of our listenership are from, you're coming up to November, you know, where where we could see a, a really interesting yeah. election. But the discourse, yeah. I mean, what can we learn from from your uh, talk, Harmony and Pursuit of Orthodoxy, in terms of applying that to being civil in our discourse leading up to November yeah. for many Americans in particular, yeah. I think? Well, I mean, a, a big part of it, I, it really dawned on me once. I was teaching uh, Fourth Nephi, and we were talking about the Zion community that that was established in the wake of the Savior's post-mortal ministry and and what it means to be one. And and then that led to Moses 7, 18, that, where the Lord defines Zion as being one heart and one mind. But then it dawned on me the second half of that verse. It's one heart and one mind, but they dwelled in righteousness and there was no poor among them. And it, it was happening like in real time in class as these thoughts are popping into my head and the spirit was really guiding the conversation in a beautiful way because it, it hit me. I said, this is going to be an oversimplification. So be aware of that, but let's, let's just wrestle with this for a moment. If you were to assign dwelling in righteousness to a particular political party, uh, and that's their, what seems to be their priority, uh, which party would that be? Uh, in other words, let's talk about moral issues in terms of dwelling in righteousness. And then the other half, making sure there's no poor among us, let's talk about social issues on that one. Do you see, I ask my students, do you see a dividing line politically between people who prioritize what they define as moral righteousness and, uh, and a, another side that prioritizes what they consider social justice? Um, and it was just all the students were like, yeah, that's pretty clear. Um, and and as you take that and superimpose it over the cross of Christ, there's a vertical component and there's a horizontal component of the cross. Uh, one of your countrymen, J.K. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, a uh, wonderful early early 20th century British Catholic, said uh, that at the core of Christianity is the cross, and at the heart of the cross is a collision and a contradiction. I mean, that's the contraries that Joseph Smith talked about and that I always talk about. Um, so you have this vertical and horizontal component and one side of a lot of issues, they want to be right with God. And uh, the other side of a lot of issues, they want to be right with neighbor. And there we have the two great commandments again. So love God with all your heart, might, mind and strength. There's the vertical. And I'm going to dwell in righteousness. And if you love me, keep my commandments. That's, that's the orthodoxy piece. But then this horizontal uh, love thy neighbor as thyself and, and reach out to those around you and, and make sure there's no poor among you and so on. Uh, that's just as important. And without both parts, you don't have the cross of Christ. And so what I was wrestling with, uh, this was a, um, the Sperry Symposium that was held back in January or February of this year. And we were all right, you know, me and my, a lot of colleagues, we're studying and writing papers on Jesus Christ in the Book of Mormon. And what had struck me recently in my study of Third Nephi was just how 
emphatically, Jesus condemns contention and says there's no cause for disputation. And what strikes me about it is these were the righteous. These are the people that were there and bountiful when Christ ascended. It's like, and, the, and what they're fighting over were really important things like the proper mode of baptism and the correct name of the church and, and maintaining the sanctity of the sacraments with church discipline. And, but in all three instances, they're disputing and contending. And the Lord says, that is not the way to go about it. And so it's like, so, but isn't orthodoxy important? Isn't the first great commandment first? Aren't we supposed to do what God asks us to do? And I think because the vast majority of church members are more conservative than the vast majority prioritize uh, orthodoxy and doctrinal clarity and keeping the commandments of God, as we should. But if we do it at the exclusion of the other half, man, we're in trouble. And we're going to end up fighting. We're going we're to be good people with good goals going about it in all the wrong way. And so what I was wrestling with is, is there a better approach to all of this? Is there a more Christian approach? What does Jesus teach the Nephites? And in both his sermon at the, at the temple and the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, uh, as well as some of the things that Jesus teaches in, throughout Third Nephi, to me it blew me away that while being right with God is still absolutely necessary, as far as I can tell from the Savior, the best approach of getting there is loving your neighbor every step of the way uh, to the point that he even calls that a doctrine of its own. So for anybody who's super interested in maintaining correct doctrine, well, contention is false doctrine. And by eliminating harmony, you have automatically eliminated orthodoxy in things that are really important to God. So if you find yourself wanting to connect with God, and find that you are disconnected from your neighbor, then you have to solve the horizontal in order to come back and connect with the vertical. And, uh, and so to me, the, the best, it was interesting. After I, I, I heard from a, a listener who had seen that uh, presentation on, on YouTube, and we started a conversation online together. It was really humble of him. He was an older father slash grandfather and said, you know, I always try to do what's right. I'm, I'm an Orthodox Latter-day Saint. I'm, I try to keep every commandment. I try to make sure God knows that I prioritize him. And so far, so good. He said, but I fear that I've alienated people that, that matter most to me because I haven't been sufficiently patient with them and understanding toward them. And I've loved God at the expense of my neighbor instead of loving God by loving my neighbor uh, and by trying to connect my neighbor back to God. Um, on that, <laughs> on the presentation, I asked AI to help me because I have no artistic talent at all. And I asked AI to create a picture of this celestial city off in the distance. And the city is orthodoxy. The city is love of God. The city is, is, is again, the celestial city. But I, I asked AI to create a road that led there that was so full of potholes that it'd be a miracle if anybody got to its destination. And there's a sign uh, along the path that says, welcome to orthodoxy. How was your trip? And that to me kind of encapsulated this whole thought of God wants us to be right with him, but he wants us to be right with each other along the way. And though it's a slow process, this is section 121 of the Doctrine and Covenants. This isn't coercion. This is invitation. This is persuasion. This is gentleness and meekness and love unfeigned. And any of you parents with struggling teenagers, you know how slow a process that can be. And so often we want to speed it up and say, this is how it has to be. And God wants, you know, this is God's expectation and you better keep his commandments or you're out of here. And ah, man, that that's contending and that drives away the spirit and no power or influence can or ought to be maintained uh, except in Christ-like ways. So um, I'm not trying to change the destination. Uh, I'm not trying to diminish the, our need to keep the commandments of God, uh, not, a, not in any way. 
but if we can soften our approach and that was that's what was so humble about this this person who reached out to me just saying i i know i've got some changing to do and not change my destination but to change my approach and i hope it's not too late to redeem some relationships that i've that i've frayed perhaps um in hopes of connecting with them so that then we can connect together with god yeah that the presentation just uh, i love hearing you talk about it it was one of those moments when i watched it for the first time thinking oh yeah yeah I, i'm making lots of notes and it just seemed to really resonate with me that message because perhaps i would say that i'm quite orthodox um in the sense that that's where i get my confidence from you know my confidence in approaching god is is in the fact that i do my daily things and uh you know i i do the right and i i pride myself in the standards that i keep and yet i i can think of several times in my life where because i have chosen that over perhaps harmony it's it's been disadvantageous to to both parties and and so especially with um the political things going on now i i love that you quoted gk chesterton he's one of my favorite thinkers and uh he you got good taste my friend oh yeah he he gave this great quote that i love and think about often which was a true warrior fights not because he hates what is in front of him but because he loves what is behind him and and for me that that kind of steered how i dealt with political situations in the future because i i thought i need people from the other side there needs to be a healthy balance uh, and i need to right. understand that they're doing this because they really care about and and love the things that they believe and it's the same for me and you know without the other side to my beliefs uh, we wouldn't have some of the wonderful things that we we do have in the world um exactly exactly goes for what they, I think. they they are seeking half of zion and I'm seeking half of Zion too. But until we can honor either, each other's halves and turn it into one great whole, then the, the oneness that is at the core of Zion will, will never quite be within our reach. Mm, I, I really hope we can. And what a great place to finish on, on some hope. Uh, and I would add to what you said before too, is that there's this narrative that is a false narrative going on around the state of the church in, in Britain. And, you know, we we all know that it's definitely becoming increasingly secular on the whole, but I'm so hopeful uh, and excited about the church in the UK and uh, and everywhere. But but Gen Z as well is really impressing oh. me. Uh, um, well, I, I think we underestimate or we forget what Nephi said, that in the last days, the, the church of the Lamb would be small comparatively, but it would be everywhere. And we think that we're supposed to be the, the, the majority. And, and whenever I cook, I, try, I use salt, but salt is never the number one ingredient. And so if we are the salt of the world, God just needs enough to be able to preserve and flavor the rest. He only needs a righteous remnant and we can turn around the whole. We, he only needs a little leaven to leaven the lump. And so to your wonderful listeners, especially those in, in Great Britain, yeah, I, my hat's off to you. Uh, my grandmother served among you as a, as a senior missionary. Uh, my, my father served in, in, the, in Ireland uh, as a young missionary decades ago. Um, I have ancestors that come from your part of the world, and, and I'm so grateful for that heritage. But to be, and to honestly, even living right here in Utah, I prefer being a religious minority. Growing up in, te- in Texas and California, my kids growing up in Tennessee, I loved that because we, we knew who we were. We, we had to stand out and stand as a light to the world. And we had to know our stuff and be able to articulate it and explain it to people that believe differently. So again, hats off to all of you, my wonderful British brothers and sisters. Uh, and, and I'm just grateful. I mean, you saved the church in the 1830s uh th- those who came to to kirtland right um and so often it's those valiant saints living against the odds that will continue to save the church in the 21st century what a beautiful place to end uh thank you jared it's been an absolute privilege i can't get my words out and uh 
yes, people should go and uh, subscribe to, I'm sure they already do, but go and subscribe to Unshaken Saints if you haven't already. And I will link the um, Harmony and Pursuit of Orthodoxy in the description too, as I feel it's very important for those who haven't watched it. But is there anything else you would add, Jared? Any any projects you want people to look out for or specific places to to direct? Oh, I just want to say thank you to you, Ben. Thank you for, for finding... There's something, there's a great line, I uh, can't remember if it's Peter or Paul who says this, but to feed the flock of God over whom the Holy Ghost hath made you overseer. That you uh, aren't required to podcast and neither am I. Uh, we have other jobs and other callings and other things that we're trying to do. But when the Holy Ghost makes you an overseer, when the Spirit whispers to you, feed my sheep, then how can you not want to go feed the flock of God, however it's possible? And because we're such a well-organized church, we organize callings for everyone. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes that limits us seeking from the Lord. Is there any other personal ministry you would want me to be involved in, independent of my church calling? And I just, I'm amazed at how much good God can do through consecrated saints. So if we'll just look to him, trust in the Lord's ability to magnify us and start offering our measly loaves and fishes, uh, it's incredible how many people, how many of God's children around the world can be filled with the bread of life. I, I just want to say thanks to your listeners. I want to just bear my witness of a loving God and a redeeming Savior. Uh, the truthfulness of the restored gospel, it, it I've, I, I hold to my faith, not out of momentum or naivete. I know what we're up against. I understand how people are, are attacking us or the concerns, the legitimate concerns that people might have with history or social stances and things like that. But I've never seen anything quite like the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. And to have its help in accessing the power of the atonement of Jesus Christ has been a as deep a blessing as I've ever had. And I'm so grateful for that. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Thanks for watching For All the Saints. This show needs your help to grow. Please like the video, comment your thoughts, subscribe to the channel, and share this with someone you think would enjoy it. Thank you.